Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show, we welcome back 02321 from over on Reddit No Sleep, or for the Agent in the Woods series. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. I just became a cop in Louisiana. There are things in the bayou. Part 1. Let's get straight into that. I recently transferred to a Louisiana police department. I don't wish to share the name of the city where I work in because this tale cannot get back to my boss. I am certain she would think I wasn't all there if she heard what I saw in the bayou while looking for a body. And a new city? <laughs> it was a bit of a culture shock. The humid weather near did me in for the first few months. Before the bayou case started, I met an odd person while on my lunch break that gave me hints of how strange this city really was. There was a fish shack near the office. It was mostly outdoor table space to eat, but I normally brought my lunch back to eat at my desk. I hated sitting outside in the sun, trying to enjoy a meal. While I was walking past the seating area, I noticed something that made me pause. A boy, belly a teen, was sulking around the trash can, and I mean sulking. The fish shack was pretty much a fast food place, and people would toss away their trash outside at the end of the meal. The boy watched as a couple got up and tossed their styrofoam container away with a few fries and a small piece of fried fish inside. He waited until they took a few steps away until he quickly pulled the container out before he could eat the scraps. I walked over to him. Hey, don't eat that. I told him and he was sort of startled and dropped the container. I didn't mean to scare him or sound so harsh. I handed him my lunch. I bent down to pick up the garbage and threw it away again. Here, eat mine if you're hungry. You really shouldn't eat trash. You could get sick. He looked up at me confused as if this was the first nice thing anyone had ever done for him. I looked him over for some signs of abuse and wondered if I could get his name and then could look into his situation. Despite the heat, he was wearing a sweater three sizes too big. The deep v-neck made the shirt slip of his narrow shoulder. His hair was a sandy colour and messily cut at his shoulders. And freckles spotted his nose and shoulders. It wasn't dirty and I didn't see any bruises so that was a good sign. Necklaces of fishing line hung from his neck and I didn't know if he'd picked up some trash to wear or if this was a new fashionable trend. Are you sure I can have this? He asked in a small voice looking around as if he was committed a crime. Of course. What's your name? I'm Officer Anthony Turner. I flashed my badge hoping it made him feel safe talking to me. He slowly took out a fry and ate it debating on if he wanted to talk. Catfish, he finally said. The one word confused me. I did order fried catfish with a side of fries, but it took me a few seconds to clue in he didn't mean my lunch. Is that your legal name? I said and he nodded. I've heard worse names since I arrived in the city. Maybe his father was really into fishing. Was his sibling name crawled out or something? I smiled at my own joke, I gestured for him to sit down at the wooden table to talk with me for a while. Well, Cavish didn't look as if he was starving, but he must have had a good reason for trying to eat from the trash. So, Catfish, what's up with trying to get table scraps? I don't mean to pry into your private life, but seeing something like that well, makes me a bit worried. He listened as he slowly started to eat and then stuffed his face full of fries to the point where he nearly choked. I gladly handed over my can of iced tea. It appeared that whoever raised this kid dropped the ball somewhere. Oh, I've wanted to try some food from here for ages. Oh, it smells great, but I don't have any money. Oh, wait. I found a few coins here and there. They're not on me, so I don't know how much they're worth. I guess I just got desperate. He explained after drinking nearly the whole can of iced tea in one gulp. Thank you for giving me this. It's a nice treat and I'll pay you back one way or another. He gave a wide smile that looked a bit too long for his face. 
A normally large mouse look unsettling, but his made him similar to a happy frog. Catfish was a good kid at least. It made me worry that someone may take advantage of him. I was glad I was the one who spotted him first. I gave him a wave at the offer to pay me back for lunch. Well, that's fine. I don't mind buying you a meal. But can I ask if you're doing all right? Are you eating enough at home? And it's a Tuesday, isn't it? Shouldn't you be in school? Well, I sounded like a worried parent. These questions will be enough to scare anyone off, but he listened while eating a bit more carefully this time. The first bite of the fried catfish made him so happy, he tapped his feet on the ground, causing his flip-flops to make a slapping sound for a few seconds. After he could focus, he went into answering my questions. I'm eating just fine. I can catch enough in the bayou to stay well fed for most days. I was taking care of someone who couldn't be alone, so I couldn't go to school. I don't have any plans of moving, so I don't really need schooling. The bayou provides me with everything I need, aside from the rare treat like this meal. He was smiling again, but I crossed my arms thinking it over. He appeared happy, and I should drop the whole thing. I felt as if he was a bit too young to be on his own, though. I've heard about people living in the bayou before, but I'd always assumed they were old hermit types. As long as he was healthy, it was none of my business, no matter how I felt about it. Do you have a cell phone or a computer at home? I asked, and he shook his head. Oh, how about you? Meet me here every Tuesday, and I'll buy you a lunch. His face lit up. Quickly, he forced down his excitement, shaking his head, feeling guilty, accepting such an offer. Well, it's a kind offer, but it's hard for me to accept things for free, he admitted. Well, you can catch things on the bayou, right? Well, my partner makes killer crawdads, but never has time to catch fresh ones. How about you bring a few over, and we can do a trade? Well, I wasn't even finished speaking when a hand shot out for us to seal the deal. I let out a laugh and shook his small hand. Catfish now didn't hide how happy he was to try different things on the menu without needing to dig around in the trash can. My lunch break was about up and I should have been back at the office a few minutes ago. I double checked to make sure Catfish was really doing alright and we made a promise to meet next week. I wanted to get his last name but I didn't push for it. Next time we spoke, I would ask. When Tuesday rolled around I met him at the fish shack as promised. I ordered whatever he wanted to try. This time, it was a fish burger with everything on top. I may have been spoiling him a little. The only problem came when he upheld his end at the bargain and brought a tub of live crawdads. Now the tub was sealed with air holes on the lid. I heard them angrily scuttling around and didn't expect them to be still alive and out for revenge. I didn't have a plan on how to deal with them at the office, but didn't bring it up to Catfish as he was happily eating his lunch. Then we parted ways and I took the tub back to the office. My partner, very confused to why I gave him a bunch of live crawdads in the middle of the workday. But he lived close by so he could swing by his place to hand them over to his wife to deal with. I didn't have the heart to tell him that more would be coming every Tuesday. For a few weeks I spent meeting up with the boy I barely knew anything about. He refused to give me a last name, saying he'd forgotten it. And I didn't pressure him into telling me anything he didn't want to. The only facts I knew about him is he lived off the land, his parents were long gone, and he was very skilled at catching crawdads, to my partner's dismay. Now Tuesdays would have continued on like that if a big case didn't break. A girl went missing, then her body was found in a bayou two days later, then another poor girl, and then another, but her body wasn't recovered, and because of the case I became too busy to meet Caffish at lunch. He fully understood and told me he was rooting for me to find the killer. I wasn't a detective and only had a very small part of the case, but I still wanted to do my best to help. I only chased down the leads that detectives didn't have time for, or took over different office tasks to free up other manpower. The constant overtime lasted for three months until a huge break happened. A suspect was identified. From what I heard, he tried taking a girl on her way home from school. What he didn't know was she took mixed martial arts since she was a child. A high school student took him by surprise and kicked the shit out of him. No other way to put it. And sadly, he got back into his car and drove off, but left behind enough blood to get a name from previous assault charges. 
This man was careful enough not to leave any DNA behind on the bodies and messed up by picking the wrong victim. We didn't know for certain if it was the same guy, but felt the odds were pretty good that it was. Now, unfortunately, the suspect was not at home when a few officers did a house call. A boat was registered to his name. He parked his car at the docks with fresh blood left behind, but his boat was nowhere to be seen. And from witness statements, he'd gone into the bayou and yet to come back to the dock. And so, we had an idea of who killed those girls and went into the bayou. Only two bodies were recovered and each were found in popular catfishing areas. We had a murderer and one more body to find. I volunteered to be a part of the search party, even though I'd never been on a bayou before and, well, never been part of a search party either. I was paired up with someone who did have experience in both. The department only cared about having manpower out looking and didn't care if I didn't know what I was doing. And before going out with the search party, I listened to some advice and bought some high rubber boots. And they turned out to be not tall enough, but at least they kept my feet somewhat dry. And going out into the swamp, chasing down a killer, I was nerve-wracking. I listened to the briefing very carefully. Everyone was paired off and we double-checked out equipment. My new partner was impressed I brought along spare batteries for the radio, but shook his head when I'd forgotten the bug spray, and we shared some after introducing ourselves to each other. I'm Trevor Kelsey. Just stay close and watch out for gators. He said and wasn't joking about the gators. I was extra nervous from those words. I took my time shaking his hand, putting off going into the swamp. I finally released Kelsey's hand so I could follow him to the boat that would take us to our search area. The bug spray didn't do much. My arms itched and my clothing was damp from the humidity. The search was already miserable and we bell and got and started. Keeping all of my complaints silent, we walked along in the swamp, my feet sinking every step. Our team was looking for the last missing girl. Well, it would be nice if we could find and catch the culprit, but everyone thought he was long gone or hiding somewhere nicer than the swamp. And since the other bodies were found in fishing areas, the rest needed to be checked over. Some places could only be reached by boat, but sometimes you could walk part of the way depending on the water level. I scratched my arms convinced bugs were biting away at me, and sweat dripped from my nose as Kelsey kept his pace slow so his novice partner could keep up. I apologised after we needed to stop because my foot was stuck. It took me a minute to get it free to carry on, and Kelsey shook his head, not looking upset for having me along. Well, everyone has a first time doing something. We had odd numbers, so unless you came along, I'd be either alone or sit this one out. At least you're willing to slug through all of this. I've been with guys who have had ten years of searching the bayou under their belt, and they bitch about every trip. I let out a short laugh, feeling better that I wasn't the worst partner he'd been stuck with. And as we walked, I kept my eyes and ears focused, trying to see any sign of human life. And the bayou was almost like an alien planet for someone like myself. The air was heavier than I'd ever felt before and chirping sounds off in the distance rattled my nerves, and every ripple of water made me tense up, expecting a gator to come out of us at any second. I didn't understand how anyone could live out here. Did Caffish really stay in the bayou, or was his place a small shack just off the edge of it? Well, this place was beautiful, and yet felt dangerous. And Kelsey noticed how nervous I was, and started up a conversation. Scared something's gonna jump out and get you? He asked in a joking tone. Actually, yes. I admit it with no shame. Ha ha ha. He laughed at me, shaking his head. If a small kid like my lunch friend could live out here, it couldn't be all that dangerous, right? I really wanted that to be the case as my foot yet again got caught. I heard a sound off in the distance before Kelsey started speaking. My head turned away from him and I half listened to trying to find the source of the other noise. Ah, don't worry about it. The key thing is to set. I was looking off into the swamp, through the mossy trees, when Kelsey suddenly stopped talking. When I turned to ask him what was wrong, I felt my heart nearly stop. The man that was a few steps away a second ago was gone. Not even any ripples on the water remained. It didn't make any sense. He was right in front and didn't have any time to walk away. 
weren't even any trees wide enough to hide behind. I wanted to believe that this was a prank on the new guy. I stayed in the same spot scanning the trees. Uh, Kelsey, this isn't funny. Can you come out so we can do our job? I shouted off into the bayou, trying to keep my voice even. And only the sounds of the swamp answered back. I felt sweat clinging to my back, but this time not from the heat. I called his name out again, trying not to freak out. A mixture of fear and the simmering rage spilled into my stomach. And grabbing my radio, I started to call in the fact that I'd lost my partner. Kelsey may get an earful about this dumb prank, but he deserved it. The radio crackled and then died. Frantically, replacing the batteries gave the same result. And pulling out my phone, I felt my hand start to tremble when it didn't even turn on. I had charged it right before we had left. It should be at least 90%, and yet it was dead. Suddenly, I felt like the final person in a horror movie. Shaking my head in an attempt to collect myself, I thought of what to do next. A blur of motion in the distance caught my eyes. Something dark moved between some trees, and it looked human. Hey, Kelsey? I called out for well knowing it couldn't be him. It was a bad idea, but I started after the figure that was now hidden behind the twisted trees. I only got a few steps when I heard a splash behind, and I turned to see another figure dart behind a different tree. I had almost missed it. This wasn't good. Whoever was messing with me, or there was more than one of them, my hand went to my holster at my side. I have drawn my weapon a handful of times and only shot at a person once before. Whatever was happening, I did not like it in the slightest. I'm with the police. We're on official business here, looking for a body. So please, do not get in the way of an investigation. I called out, unsure of what else to say. A chattering sound came. It sounded almost like laughter. And I was not going to take the friendly approach any longer. Weapon drawn, I scanned the trees, looking for more of those dark figures as that horrible sound echoed around. Air caught in my lungs when the sound stopped and I saw the cause. A massive shadow started to swim through the water into my direction. I scrambled, trying to find solid ground, which was rare in that swamp. The water was only ankle deep in spots, and something large enough to cast such a shadow should be too big to swim in such shallow water. In taking my eyes off the dark shape, I looked up trying to see if what I was seeing was a shadow of a plane or a really weird cloud, nothing but the treetops and a clear blue sky. The splashing sound jerked my attention back down, convinced an alligator finally decided that I was a tasty snack. Weapon raised, I almost fired. What I saw made me lower my handgun and all tension fade from my shoulders. I was surprised, but I didn't think of him as a threat. Catfish? What the hell are you doing here? I demanded in a stressed voice. The boy I'd become friends with was coming out of the swamp. Water dripping from his loose clothing. How did he sneak up on me, and why did he look like he was coming out of a much deeper part of the water when it was so shallow? You really shouldn't be on this side. What are you doing here? He said, tossing my question back at me. My job. I know you live in a bayou, but... No, uh, never mind. Have you seen my partner? He was just here. Looking around, I almost expected to see Kelsey again, or at least those figures off in the distance. I was so strung out, I didn't even register what Caffish first said. He was twisting the edge of his sweater, trying to get some of it dry. A friendly face was nice, even if I didn't know what was going on. No, I haven't seen any human besides yourself lately. I heard your voice and came over, really not expecting to see you here. I guess you, after that other man who came through a little while ago, dropping a dead girl off. I'm not sure where the girl is, though. Staring at the boy, my mouth nearly dropped open. Caffish might know where the suspect was. He was a dangerous man and really hoped he didn't see the boy and was coming after the only witness. And what did he mean by the only human? I knew kids his age could be a bit weird thinking. They're vampires and such, but Caffish, well, he didn't seem like the type. Uh, some weird stuff's been going on. Oh, please don't add to it. Did the other man see you? Do you think you were safe? Oh, he didn't see me. He's dead. 
The others living in the bayou got him. I suppose it's your job to get proof of his death. Let's do that and I'll guide you out of here. I do owe you, after all. Well, so much for not adding to the witness. Catfish was far too calm, telling me about the man's death. That fact startled me more than anything else he'd hinted at. The boy started to walk easily through the swamp, leaving me helplessly following slowly after him. What do you mean by the others? Who killed him? And no matter how hard I tried, I was unable to catch up to the boy. He walked as if the swamp was normal ground. I kept getting stuck, and the heat wasn't helping. And Calfish didn't look as if he wanted to answer my very important question. And with a shrug, he nodded his head off towards the trees. Well, you might see little glimpses of them. You know, others. I don't talk to them much, so I don't know what they are. He said with another shrug. What the hell is going on? I was out here trying to find a missing girl to bring some sort of closure to her family, so they could bury her. Now, I was following behind a boy I thought I knew. He was implying that there were things besides bugs and gators in this place. All of this was a prank. For my own sanity, it needed to be one. Catfish, you've been talking about weird stuff since I saw you. What are you getting at? What did I just stumble into? He stopped walking to look over his shoulder. Her eyes met, and I noticed how dark and deep they appeared. For a moment, those eyes were not that of a child, but of something much older. When he turned... A smile was on his face, and the expression that made him look like a happy little frog made me relax. Whatever was going on, someone was on my side. Well, let's just get proof of that man's body for now. After you're in a safe spot, I'll explain things a little more. Well, that was acceptable. If he did start explaining what was going on, I doubted I would understand it or even want to hear it. That moment, I just wanted to focus on doing my job. The weird stuff? Oh, I could wait. At least, I wanted the weird stuff to wait. As I struggled through the water and over spongy ground, the sky started to grow darker. That made us both nervous. It should still be only noon, and there was no rain in the forecast. The bayou was bad enough. Walking through it in the rain, huh, that would be a nightmare. It felt like an hour of trudging along and sweating until Catfish finally stopped. He pointed a few feet in front of a bundle of clothing. And first, I didn't notice those rags still had a human inside. Well, the smell it was awful. And pulling my shirt over my nose, I walked towards it. Catfish staying behind. You shouldn't see a terrible sight like this. And normally, insects would make a meal out of the body, out in the open like this. But none had touched the corpse. And the body was face down, meaning I needed to flip it over to try and confirm the man's identity. I didn't want to contaminate the scene any more than I already had. And pulling out my phone, I checked up, begging it to turn on, so I could take photos and document the position of the body. A miracle happened, and it flickered to life. Wasted no time, I tried calling my boss. And then 911, but nothing went through. Or at least I could take the photos I wanted. When I thought I got enough photos, I finally forced myself to grab a stick to roll the body over. My stomach tightened, and I nearly lost my light lunch as the corpse bobbed in a shallow water. He wasn't dead for very long. I could tell that much. Right away, I knew this was our suspect, but was unable to snap a photo of his face right off the bat. And I lost my lunch, while my eyes landed on his torn open and empty torso. A wild animal had gotten to him first. The water washing away most of the blood and leaving the corpse flesh pale. In training I'd seen bodies, but never was the one to be the first to discover one. And as I was recovering, a sound came from my hip that nearly made me jump out of my skin. My radio crackled to life. It was only static, but it gave me some hope of getting someone over here to help. Because I was so focused on the radio, I wasn't paying attention to Catfish suddenly moving closer. Come in, this is... Only a few words left my lips as the soggy ground from under my feet was gone. My body sank like a brick in deep murky water. The foul-tasting water entered my mouth before I could hold my breath. 
and sinking down, the water became colder, and I nearly screamed when something touched my ankle. It was a hand, and at first I assumed it was someone trying to help, until more hands came clawing through the cold darkness, grabbing any part they could. I wanted to scream, but if I did, I would die. My lungs wouldn't hold for very long. A short while ago, I was with Kelsey, and my only worries was an alligator or a serial killer. Now the bayou reached out to take my life, and there was nothing I could do about it. My arms were pinned from the countless hands. I couldn't even try to struggle to the surface or grab my handgun as a blunt object to attack the cold hands. Regrets flashed through my mind. My lungs about to burst, my brain went through everything it knew trying to find a way out of this impossible situation. And just as my time ran out, the hands let go to scatter back into the dark, and someone else took a hold to save a scared novice officer from nearly dying. And coughing and sputtering out the grimy water, the ordeal left it impossible to see my saviour for a few minutes. Yes, I was thankful to be alive, but confused over what the hell just happened. Turner, you alright? What the hell, man? Kelsey's voice cut through the panic of nearly dying. It dragged me to better ground as it coughed up the rest of the water that I'd nearly swallowed, and rubbing my eyes clear, I looked over the scene. He stood, looking as panicked as I felt. My gear was ruined, but he was already on a working radio, calling for backup. <coughs> what? I started, voice too hoarse to speak. We were just walking along and... You just got pawed under. A dedicator. Christ on a stick. When did that body get there? Kelsey's attention was directed towards the dead man floating near where he'd saved me. And neither of us spoke until the other teams arrived, thinking it was an alligator attack, not a body retrieval. The entire discovery was impossible to explain, and so we both just went with whatever questions that were asked, given the only answers we could. My boots was missing, and my pants torn and so it was assumed that an alligator did grab me to pull me under. The vague answers sounded as if I was in shock over nearly losing my leg and my life. Now the killer was found, and his last victim was also recovered by a different, more experienced search team. And after his body was found, enough evidence came to light proving he was the killer, and the case was closed. His official cause of death was an animal attack. The resolution felt a little bitter, However, that man was no longer able to harm another person. And waiting to the next Tuesday, <laughs> I was agony. At first, I thought the strange events of meeting Cafish in the bayou were a false memory from nearly drowning. But it felt too damn real to dismiss until I saw Cafish again and asked him some questions. Now, he was late and I didn't think he was going to show. And for a while, I worried his entire existence was false. And sitting... In the hot sun, sipping on an iced tea, I waited until my lunch break was nearly up. And finally, Catfish sat on the other side of the table, a kind smile on his face. I guess you have questions, he started. A few. I don't really know where to start. I guess... Are you human? Nope. The reply came with no hesitation. I'm just a catfish. Now that I was looking at him more, he did have fish traits, and I was kicking myself mentally for not noticing before. His oversized sweater sleeves looking like fins, his messy hair poking out on both sides of his head, almost like whiskers, and his freckles the same kind of spots a catfish skin may have. His smile now looked more like a fish than a frog the more I looked. He even wore fish in line and lures. How obvious could it be? Just a catfish. I repeated, looking the boy over. Normally humans can't see me. You have really good sight, and because you're interacting with me, in my human form, others can see me as well. But the issue is your sight was too good. You accidentally got onto the other side of the bayou, where I live, and the other things hunt. If I didn't drag you back to your side, then you would have been taken by the same ones that killed that man. I'm not the type to really stick my nose in business like that, but you brought me food, and I did owe you. Sitting back, his answers played through my mind. It explained why Catfish didn't bring any crawdads this time. We were even. Hell, I owed him now. In a way, 
Catfish only gave a vague description of what happened and what he was. Well, it was good enough for me. I didn't want to know about supernatural things happening deep in the swamp. But if I stayed at the department, I may need to go back into the bayou again. Moving and finding a new job sounded like such a hassle when there was a better option. If I buy you lunches, will you be able to keep me from going onto your side of the bayou if I need to search in it again for work? I asked, hopeful. Cavish made a show of humming over the idea, and when the smells of the fish shack drifted over on the wind, he broke down, unable to keep up the act, and with a sheepish smile, he gave a small nod. If you can make it Tuesdays and Fridays, I can make sure you don't slip up again. And reaching out my hand, we shook on it. My wallet may take a hit, but it was better than uprooting my life or dying in the swamp. Plus, Catfish was a nice kid. In the very least, he deserved a good meal twice a week. I just became a cop in Louisiana. There are things in the bayou. Part 2. Let's get straight into that. I was still adjusting to the move across the country and a new job. In the past few months, I made a habit of buying lunch for a boy named Catfish. Before I met him, I didn't believe in supernatural things, but after a trip into the bayou, I was forced to see there were some things beyond natural in the world. And somehow that fact didn't shake my view on life. I carried on like normal. As long as I stayed away from those supernatural threats, or I would be safe. At least, that's what I assumed. And for two days a week, I spent my lunch break with Catfish, who was, well, a catfish. He appeared human, but I knew he was something else. Maybe not just a fish, but something much more dangerous. Because I brought him food, we became friends. And he promised to protect me if I did slip up and come across something unnatural threatening my life. He was such a powerful thing in a small body. I never needed to worry about losing a fight again. Well, that's what I thought. On my lunch break, I was out at our usual spot. Catfish hadn't shown up yet and I was worried about it. He never missed out on getting free food. The only time we didn't meet is if my job got in the way. And as the minutes passed, I grew more anxious about him. He didn't own a cell phone and there was no way to contact him to see if he was alright. And just as it felt as if my nerves were going to get the better of me, a man stopped beside my table. At a glance, it was obvious he knew Catfish and he wasn't human. His hair was long and unkempt, his eyes so light it looked as if they didn't have any colour to them, stared down at me. He was wrapped in a blanket, torn and dirty, and bare feet stuck out from under the sheet. He gave me a cold stare, face somewhat hidden behind his hair. Oddly enough, it felt as if I'd seen him before, but I could not place his face. Cavish is in trouble. You need to save him. Follow me. Giving me no time to respond, he turned and started away. My stomach sank. Images of that kind boy flashed through my mind as I got up stumbling over my own feet in a rush to follow this man. I called into work, saying a family emergency had come up and I needed the rest of the day off. And since I'd yet to miss a day, my boss let me call in on short notice. I kept asking the stranger questions about Catfish and what was going on, but he didn't respond. Instead, he paused looking me over with a face that could freeze fire. Do you own a car? I nodded at this, and this time he followed me. It was only a short walk back to the office, and yet each second passed impossibly slowly. When we got to my car, he sat on the passenger seat again, not speaking much. Other than giving me directions, he refused to answer any important questions. We drove to a small dock with a rowboat at the end. He stood in the front of the boat, facing away, keeping perfect balance as I swayed the small craft getting in. The moment both of my feet were on the wood, the boat started to glide down the water on its own. And after what happened the last time in the bayou, I wasn't keen on entering it again. My stomach twisted in stress and fear. I wished the boat would go faster so I could find my small friend and hopefully get him out of trouble. I didn't understand what I could even do. I was human and felt helpless against any supernatural threat. 
and the boat steered through narrow waterways. The bayou around us, an amazing piece of natural life, full of creatures and life they would never fully understand. It was still early in the afternoon, and yet the lights around us looked golden, as if the sun was starting to set. I spotted catfish before the boat reached him. I needed to steer around some wet but solid ground. The boy was on his back, covered by a dirty blanket on a soggy bank. I didn't wait for the boat. I jumped out, rushing towards him, and finding it hard to move in a damp ground. My shoes soaked, and pants went up to the knees. I pressed on, frantic. And when I reached him, I collapsed next to the sleeping boy, thinking the worst. Cat, what happened to him? I demanded up at the man who stopped beside us. Catfish was pale, his breathing weak and ragged, the blanket covering a frail boy stained by what I feared to be blood. The man looked almost emotionless, not affected by my outburst. He was attacked by a creature. They tore out an organ for who knows what reason. He's tough, but can't hold on for more than a day or so. The man said in a low voice. Well, he sounded angry, but it was easy to see. He was upset at himself for not protecting Catfish. Lifting a boy into my lap, I shuddered over how cold he felt. I placed a hand on his damp forehead, feeling as if I was going to burst. The reasons I moved, the, the reasons I moved across the country came flooding back, seeing him like this. I forced them all down to focus on what I could do. We need to get him to a hospital. And the man shook his head. If it was that simple, he would have already done it. For some reason, he brought me here. Well, that was a hopeful sign. I would do anything to save this kind child. There is a creature that lives deep in the bayou. She can make something to heal him. However, she does not do exchanges with other supernatural things. I can bring you to her. He explained. Put him in the boat. We go right now. When the man shook his head at what I said, I heard a noise from Catfish and I kept brushing his hair out of his face, trying to soothe him. No, he must stay here. The place we are going to is dangerous. You might not even make it. I cannot watch over him and you at the same time. I hated leaving Caffish behind while he was suffering. I understood why he needed to do so, and I didn't have anyone I could call to watch the boy for me. If I called my partner, he would rush Catfish to a hospital right away. Don't! A small voice came from the boy in my arms. I was glad he was strong enough to speak, but hearing his voice, it broke my heart. I wanted to kill whatever did this to him. And instead of looking as if he was in pain, the boy smiled up at me. It wasn't his usual wide smile that made my chest tighten. Turner, it's fine. Don't risk your life for me. Well, it's not fine. There is no way we're leaving you to die like this. He looked up with a strained expression. He knew I wasn't going to back down, and the last thing he wanted was a friend to get hurt for his sake. The thought of someone dying for him may hurt him more than having an organ ripped out. I'll protect him. I am strong enough for that now. I do not need to rely on your strength, so this man shall not die on your behalf. The man stood confident in our mission. Caffish did not appear to share the same thoughts. He closed his eyes and let out a sigh, knowing he couldn't stop us. Please, just come back alive no matter what. I promised him we would. Speaking drained, catfish of his strength, and he fell asleep again. I gave him a few moments to rest before lifting him to place the boy under a tree, hoping it was a better spot instead of his legs being in the water. The man silently watched as I promised catfish again. I would save him and placed a kiss on top of his head. I was facing an entire bayou of supernatural creatures far beyond my power and understanding. I barely knew anything about this area because I'd recently moved from a colder part of the country. This trip would truly be venturing into the unknown. When I turned to face the mystery man ready to press forwards and not wanted to waste any more time. And he gave me a nod and led me back to the boat I could do nothing but sit as we started to go further and deeper into the bayou and into a swamp. As we drifted along, it got darker and darker. The man took a thick stick from the bottom of the boat and wrapped some fabric around the end to make a torch. 
and after he lit it, he stood at the front of the boat again, the fire lighting our way. And due to the darkness, it was impossible to see past the firelight. I heard things chattering off in the dark and splashes of the water around us. My hand gun hurt my hip. I felt jumpy and ready to draw it. A gun might not be much against these monsters in a place like this, but it was better than nothing. Finally, the boat hit land, and we got off onto damp ground, my feet sinking with every step. Hyper aware of everything around me, I followed the stranger being guided by the faint light. The man hadn't introduced himself, and the feeling of seeing him before never faded. And it was either solving that mystery, or letting the fear of the dark take over. Have we... have we met before? I asked him in a low voice. No. He didn't even take his attention off the path. I knew his face, but not his voice. A twig snapped, and I couldn't see what caused it. And because my guy didn't appear worried, I didn't stop walking. My palms felt sweaty from stress. I just wanted us to hurry and save catfish, but we remained at a slow walking speed. You have a gun, correct? Do not use it unless needed. It will not kill anything here. Just piss them off. He warned and then gave me a quick glance over his shoulder. Do you work at the police station we took your car from? Well, that was a bit of an off-topic question, but I nodded. He didn't elaborate on why he had asked. And suddenly, I remembered why I knew this man when I thought of his face and the station. Every day, I had walked by his photo on the way to my desk, along with photos of other fallen officers from that station. You're Troy Gavin. What on earth are you doing in the swamp? I blurted out. His pace stopped for a moment at my words before carrying on. At some point, this man was a human. I worked as a detective two years before I'd got the job. I'd heard some about his past, and it was slowly coming back in bits and pieces. He disappeared and was assumed dead. But there was a reason for that, that I was forgetting. That's a long story. He started. I have nothing else to do. I don't mean to pry if you don't want to tell me, though. I commented with a shrug. Another glance as he decided to answer my questions. It was a sign we were in a safer part of the bayou, if he was fine, speaking so casually. I worked as a detective in the same station you're at. Some little girls were being kidnapped and murdered. I was able to track down the murderer, but the problem was it was a priest. The combination of a good lawyer and his flock giving him a false alibi got him off for the murders. We walked. Gavin's voice low in the oppressing darkness around us. The torch flickered and I started to feel a terrible pit of ice forming in my stomach. Details of the case I heard about came back to my memory, and I regretted asking Gavin about it. I knew what that priest did when he got off free. Gavin continued on, regardless. When he got out, he raped and killed my ten-year-old sister. And I felt cold and needed to stop walking. Gavin also half turned in my direction, his face with a hard expression. I never should have asked, and I shook my head, trying to clear it. I'm so sorry. I bet that lawyer and the people who vouched for him couldn't forgive themselves for helping a monster like that. For a moment, Gavin almost looked amused in the firelight. Something reflected off his finger, and for the first time, I noticed a wedding band. He gave up a married normal human life and turned into something else. I knew the priest was dead but didn't hear the details on how that had happened. New cops normally didn't get the download on all the older cases, unless they were really interesting or relevant. The lawyer quit. The ones who gave the false alibis had their lives ruined in some way or another. I could arrest a priest for my sister's murder, but I wanted everyone to suffer. I wanted that lawyer to lose everything. I wanted to torment him in the most painful way possible. In the end, I did so. I found the three words to say that would utterly ruin him. And swallowing the lump that had formed in my throat, I almost didn't want the answer I'd asked for. A girl died, but that man was just doing his job. If he quit after, he might not have known the priest was guilty and just did what he was hired for. And I didn't know how I felt about Gavin taking revenge on the man. What? What did you say to him? 
I asked in a strained voice. I love you. My heart skipped a beat and my eyes went back to the wedding band. This man did the cruelest thing he could think of by marrying the lawyer who felt responsible for his little sister's murder. Instead of harassing him or physically assaulting the other man, he drove in emotional pain every time he looked at his new husband. I couldn't imagine being so heartless to do such a thing. And when I didn't respond, Gavin turned to carry on. I belong here. I was already a monster before Catfish showed me how to turn into one. His voice was low as we started walking again. I thought I heard some soft sounds under his voice, but replied before I started to try and find the source. Did you come here because you feel guilty for what you did? I asked, unable to keep the question unspoken. And suddenly, sound erupted from behind. It was something that did not belong in a bayou. It was so foreign and unnerving, I couldn't help myself from turning around and trying to find out what was making it. It was clapping. Not scattered clapping, but rhythmic clapping, as if hundreds of people were all clapping at once, and in a beat only they knew. Don't look at them, Gavin warned, and it was too late. When I looked, the darkness came away all at once. The bayou looked like it was at dusk with enough light to see by my eyes adjusted, and I saw countless figures crowding between the mossy trees. They clapped, but stopped the second my eyes landed on them. All stood frozen in time, hands raised similar to a prayer. Each and every one of these people were dead. Glossy blank eyes stared as the smell hit. Rotted flesh peeled away from bones, and clothing hung off their thin frames. My mouth opened to scream, but no noise came out as all at once they rushed forwards. A hand then wrapped around my eyes, and Gavin grabbed around my shoulder from behind to drew me closer. I felt the air rush past as those figures ran by, the clapping starting up again. I screamed then, but the noise being drowned out by the clapping sound, and as suddenly as it happened, it stopped. Gavin lowered his hands and went back to the still-lit torch she dropped. I was still trembling, and breathing hard, not understanding what I had just seen. The light faded back to a darkness that made it impossible to see if there was more of the dead looking at us. What? I croaked out, unable to walk. Gavin took my arm and dragged my shaking body forwards until I could take some steps on my own. He wasn't afraid in the slightest. That fact made dread spread through my entire body. I had just witnessed the most frightening thing of my life, and it didn't even faze him. That was just a tide. Don't worry about it. Unless you pay attention to them, you won't get swept up in it. He explained. That? A, a tide? This place? Can I ever understand anything about it? I asked. He paused and shook his head. He could tell me everything about the side of the bayou, where he and Catfish lived, but I was human. I would never understand what creatures roamed, and the reasons for their existence. If I was lucky, that army of the dead would be the only thing we came across. I wasn't. I just became a cop in Louisiana. There are things in the bayou. The finale. Let's get straight into that. Keeping a hand on my sidearm at all times were pushed on. I didn't even dare slap the bogs away, trying to make a meal out of me. And the further we went, the more the darkness fought against the torchlight. I needed to stay on Gavin's heels to stay inside the light. And he was also looking tense. Beads of sweat ran down his face. The man looking ready to attack at any moment. And squinting, I thought I saw something beyond our light. A small dot of colour. We slowly got closer and the collar grew larger. It appeared to be a flicker in light. A candle, maybe. Hope filled my chest for a second. Is that? I asked in a whisper, and something in the darkness reacted to my voice. A large claw came down on Gavin, causing him to cry out in pain. It tore away his clothing and took parts of his chest with it. The torch was dropped, and somehow it managed to push me back and out of danger. I watched horrified on the ground from being shoved so hard and fell over my own feet. Gavin clutched at his bleeding chest and growled at whatever attacked 
a second before. The hut is a bit ahead of us. Run towards the light, he shouted over his shoulder. The claw came back into our light and he jumped back, causing his wounds to spill blood over the ground. I stood on trembling legs wanting to help. My gun was out, without being aware, I drew it. I can't leave you, I said sternly. Don't be stupid. Just run. I'll be fine. His words were nearly cut off by the claw coming back. This time he grabbed a hold of it by the wrist, his fingers digging into the black scaled flesh. He did not, in fact, look fine. But even so, I needed to trust him. I couldn't do anything else, and I ran, leaving him behind with the torch. When I was a few feet away, I realized that was what he was waiting for. He could not fight back unless I was out of the way. A roar, along with the sounds of trees being torn from the earth, made me look at where Gavin once stood. From his form burst forth a massive creature. The man was not human, but I never imagined what he truly was. Flames burst from the small torch to surround his true body, swirling dangerously. I felt the heat from where I stood. A giant tail came crashing through and knocked thin trees aside. In the middle of those glowing flames stood an albino alligator. He tore through the darkness, large whips of his tail nearly missing me as I fled. The creature could easily tear apart the bayou if it wished. And I ran away from the scene, towards the flicker of light in the darkness. Tripping along, I didn't slow down. The battle I left echoed through the dark. No matter how much I pushed it, it felt like that small flicker of a candle wasn't getting closer. A hand darted out from the inky dark, grabbing a hold of my arm. I shook it off to keep running. When I nearly drowned, countless hands tried to take me down into the water. Now they were trying to pull me into the never-ending darkness. They tore my clothing, rips and doing their best to keep me still. And I wasn't going to give up. I refused. Catfish was going to die unless I kept running. He couldn't save me this time, and Gavin was busy with bigger threats. More and more of those hands grabbed as I pulled my body away. It felt like I was walking through molasses, and yet the candlelight didn't get any closer. In the moment my body nearly gave up on its own, I slammed into something. Fumbling in the dark, my hands ran along the wall I was against to find that it wasn't a wall, but a door. Finding the handle, I put everything I had left to push open the door and fell into a small hut. I collapsed onto the wooden floor, unable to stay awake any longer. I woke up, not knowing where I was or how long I'd been out for. Sitting up, my head felt heavy and my body throbbed in pain. I was in a small hut, candles burning for light and a fireplace on the far side of the room burning away. Instead of a spooky witch's hut that I'd expected, the place was decorated in lace and soft pastel colours, plush armchairs and couches looking like they were from the 60s sad. Tea sets lined the shelving. And I slowly stood, not knowing if I'd arrived in the right place. Human, what brings you here? A raspy voice made me jump. I grabbed for my weapon to find it missing. Those hands from before must have grabbed it. The voice belonged to the creature standing by the fire. I was certain hadn't been there before. It was a bit taller than myself. The cloak kept most of its face and form hidden, but the long snout poking from under the fabric made it clear what the creature was. Clawed hands picked up a fire poker to move the embers around as I collected myself. I was staring at an upright alligator. A long tail came from under the cloak leaving drag marks on the dusty floor. I... Catfish is hurt. Uh, I've come here for some help. Uh, miss. No one had told me this creature's name. All I knew was it was a female. And after poking a fire some more, she replaced the poker. And finally, she turned her half-hidden face in my direction. Names hold power. You shall not learn mine. I may be able to help you. Are you aware there shall be a price for my assistance? Her voice was low and hard to hear, as if she didn't speak often. Anything to save him. Please, I can't let Cat die. 
I wasn't wise to show how desperate I was, but after everything, I couldn't hold it back. A soft sound, almost like a laugh, came from her as she walked over to a table holding countless teacups. Things. I do not desire things. They are boring. With those words, she dropped the teacup, letting it shatter on the floor. But words, they are not. They hold power. They can amuse me. My price to save catfish is simple. Answer my question. Why do you wish to save him? As she spoke, she walked over until her snout almost touched my face. I felt myself start to sweat from stress. What did she mean? Why did anyone need a reason to want to save someone? It was just something people did without thinking. There had to be some sort of trap in this simple question. He's a good kid. Of course I would want to save him. I answered and it didn't please her. A kid? That creature is almost as old as the bayou itself. But that is not your true answer. I ask again. Why do you wish to save him? The things I wanted to forget started to creep in. The reasons for moving and leaving everything behind. The reasons why I changed my entire life and went somewhere I knew nothing about. This creature knew it was related to why I kept buying lunch for catfish and why we still spent time with each other. I shook my head, trying to banish the thoughts. Oh, it's just... There isn't a reason. I lied. And she gave out a hiss. Back in a way, I felt words catching my throat. I knew she was about to toss me out. Unless I said the truth, Catfish wouldn't be saved. And yet admitting my shame was harder than fighting through the bayou. I just wanted to forget everything. Yet it was my past that could save someone I cared about. And I stood, trying to speak. It was like a nightmare where I couldn't even scream. I, that single word broke the dam when the rest flooded out. I want to save him because, because my girlfriend miscarried and I'm scared I won't have kids. She, she never wanted any and yet it just happened. I didn't know how badly I wanted to raise a child until we lost ours. For months I kept thinking of the possible outcomes of what I could have been and what never happened. My son or daughter died that day, and my girlfriend, she nearly did too. Christ, I'm such an awful person. I cared more about not having a child more than her life. And so, I moved thinking it would be better for her. When I saw Catfish, I just... Oh, it just felt as if he was the child I never met. I'm such a piece of shit. I want to save him because I'm using him as a replacement. Tears came to my eyes, and I kept my head down, unable to meet the creature's gaze. Admitting everything for the first time, out loud, hurt more than anything else in my life. Cutting an arm off would have hurt less. It was something I could never forgive myself for. Regardless of how I saw Catfish, he didn't deserve to die because of my feelings. And the creature let out another hiss, but this time it sounded as if she was laughing. You humans never cease to amuse me. Fine, wait one second. My head shot up, chest filled in light, hoping I'd heard her right. She shuffled around, digging through cupboards and teapots. And finally, she found what she was looking for. She walked over to hand me a vial of clear liquid. Pour some of this over his wound and make him drink the rest. Now hurry and get your disgusting alligator out from here. He's making the worst racket, and I can't stand it. The thank you was stuck in my throat. Instead, I raised an eyebrow at the alligator comment. She waved her hand in a shooing motion. Even from all of my stress, I almost laughed. Finally thanking her, I left the hut frightened of what I would see outside. What was outside was a sight I never would expect. The bayou, well, it was brighter, looking like the sun just rose. In front of the hut was a trail of destruction. 
deep grooves in the ground where water started to seep in, trees torn apart or smoldering. In the middle of the mess stood Gavin, looking perfectly fine. I made a shortcut back, he announced. I was starting to think this guy was the scariest thing in the bayou at that moment, and I was thankful Catfish made friends with him. We wasted no more time on small talk, racing through the path Gavin opened up, and we found the boat much faster than expected. It was agony sitting on the wooden seat as the boat floated along. Catfish was out there still hurt, and I just wanted to get back to him as fast as possible. And finally, I saw him through the trees. I again got out of the boat to rush over to the boy, vial in hand. My heart sank when Catfish appeared even worse than before. Wasting no time, I lifted a blanket to get a good look at his wound for the first time. I nearly shut down at the gaping hole on his side. In steadying myself, I did what I was told. I poured the liquid over the wound, and it made Catfish flinch, showing he was still alive then getting him to drink some was a bit of a task. After the vial was empty, I took him into my arms to wait. Gavin had stayed on the boat, not even looking in our direction. He must feel guilty for Catfish getting hurt in the first place, and I couldn't bring myself to go over to him. I wasn't sure what I was waiting for. And as I held the boy, his wound healed when I wasn't paying attention. He then coughed a few times and sat up with his own strength. Looking around confused, his eyes landed on me, alive but completely worn out. Unable to help himself, he crushed my ribs in a tight hug. I was worried you weren't going to come back. You promised me to never do anything stupid like that again, Catfish scolded. I hugged him back so thankful that he was alive. Going through any kind of nightmare, Bayou was well worth his life. His clothing torn, he looked just as bad as I did. And giving him a proper look over, I noticed something different about the boy. It was hard to place. His freckles were toned down slightly, and his mouth didn't appear as wide as before. It appears the one who kept me alive has a terrible sense of humour. Looks like I was healed, but also turned into a human. Catfish announced after looking himself over. What? Why? I asked, shocked. Well... I lied to you before when I said I was just a catfish. I'm... I'm something else. But because human would not understand my form, I went with a name of something I resembled. The organ that was stolen is something humans do not have. So, if I'm human, I would no longer be dying due to it missing. My mouth dropped open as he spoke. It made sense in a way. But was it really easy to change what he was instead of just healing him? Or maybe that woman did it for a laugh. What are you going to do now? I mean, can you live here with all these dangerous monsters around? Do you think Gavin can watch over you? Caffish looked over at a man standing in the boat, watching us before shaking his head. Well, I suppose this will wear off and I'll return to what I was before fully healed, but I don't know how long it can take. There is a chance that I'll survive here until then, but... Uh, it's a dangerous place. I guess I'll just have to make it work. Well, he nearly died and yet Catfish didn't look concerned. He gave a shrug, not worried about his future. After all, we met because he was trying to eat from the garbage. He might just be fine being homeless, but I couldn't let that happen. You can stay with me, I told him. That startled him more than his near-death experience. And shaking his head, he was refusing because he was embarrassed rather than not wanting to take my offer. I couldn't, he started shyly. This is a selfish offer on my part, I told him. I spent the next few minutes explaining to him what made me move in the first place and how I'd been using his company. I found the words easier to say the second time. I fully expected him to hate me or be disgusted over the truth of why I wanted him in my life. Instead, he gave me a calm smile. As long as you're happy and don't mind me taking up space, then I would like to stay with you until I return to what I was before. It was a mutual, beneficial agreement. Catfish got food and shelter, and I could treat him like the child I wanted. It may be twisted and selfish on my part, but he didn't appear to care in the slightest. Gavin then brought along the boat so we could get out on the bayou. 
Catfish was still exhausted, so he fell asleep as the boat drifted along towards the dock. And staring at Gavin's back, I felt a little guilty, taking Catfish away. Is this all right? I asked the man. Well, as long as he's happy, then it is. We didn't speak again until the boat bumped against the wooden dock. I lifted Catfish onto my back to carry him off the boat, and pausing, I looked at Gavin, who still stood in the boat, giving me a cold stare. You should go back home. You don't belong in the bayou, I told him. His face twisted into a snarl at those words, and for a moment I thought that he would attack. I told you, I'm a monster. I do belong there. He hissed in rage. Well, you kept the wedding ring, I replied in a soft tone. Well, his face fell, and then he turned away, looking distraught over that fact. He couldn't hide the fact he'd loved the man he'd married. The relationship may have started out as revenge, but it turned into something more than that. And I wondered if his partner was hurting more now that he had left. He walked back to the front of the boat, and it started to drift away from the dock. Ah, I'll think about it, Gavin said finally, before he got too far away. And I watched until he was out of sight, before turning away to bring Catfish home. In the days after that event, I told my boss my nephew arrived and I was taking care of him for a while. Catfish would drop by the station to bring me lunch on days we didn't go out. Everyone loved him. I wanted to put him in school, but because he didn't have any kind of paperwork, that was impossible. Instead, we started on worksheets found online as homework. And neither of us knowing how long he would remain human for. It could be a year. It could be longer. Until he returned to the bayou, I was glad to let him stay. Now, a few months after taking in Catfish, I walked into work and noticed something different. A small change that made me smile. Troy Gavin's photo was taken down from the fallen officer wall. He might not have returned home, but at least now people knew that he was still alive. It was a small step, and I was proud of him. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What a wholesome but also quite chilling story there from our really good friend 02321 from over on Reddit No Sleep. Once again, 02, absolutely smashing story. Really relatable characters and a great foreboding sense of doom throughout the entire story. Of course, as ever, I thank you for your input and support on the channel and I really hope you enjoyed my rendition. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack of things, then please, please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. As ever, guys and girls, a huge thank you for your continued support and patience with the upload schedule at the moment. I hope you're all well and happy and taking a fight back to life and searching for greatness. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.